Another crab's treasure is, in essence, baby's first souls-like. Or should I say, shoals-like. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But seriously. That's not to say another crab's treasure is easy by any means, because it's not, but it's colorful exterior, more straightforward game design, and accessibility features that allow you to engage with it on your own terms make it the absolute best first Souls-like you could choose, if you're wondering if it's your genre. It's also oozing with references and homages to not only FromSoft's catalog, but to other indie games as well. But we're not here to review another crab's treasure. We are here to talk about its lore and its story. This will contain spoilers, consider this your warning, and let's get right into it. In Another Crab's Treasure, you play as Krill, a content little hermit crab living a simple little life in his peaceful little shell. That is, until one day when a lone shark comes around and tells him that the area has been annexed by the Duchess and Krill is behind on his taxes. He tries to pay his debts with some heart kelp that he has lying around, but is told that under the new jurisdiction, they no longer barter with worthless natural resources like heart kelp and pearls. Instead, they use junk, specifically microplastics. Since he doesn't have any junk lying around, the lone shark takes Krill's home and runs off with Krill in pursuit. Krill finds a crab and asks for directions, but the crabs have all lost their minds and attack him. We later find out that this infection is called the gunk and is a result of pollution. Our little hero escapes and finds a fork to defend himself. Arriving on the outskirts of the kingdom, Krill finds a snail who is complaining about the Duchess and her taxes and how they aren't even being used for anything that helps the people. Krill then says that he's going to go talk to the Duchess and see if she can waive his taxes for him. And then the snail is like, oh, you think you're better than us and you don't need to pay your taxes? You just want to freeload? And this gets him so mad that he tries to kill Krill. It doesn't work out for him. Krill then makes his way to the palace, but is turned away because he's naked because they took a shell. The guards advise Krill to head east where he's going to find a really chill guard named Nefro, just a sweet, huggable guy. Krill goes over there but doesn't find anybody, so he just takes one of the soda cans to wear on his back. Just then, Nefro comes back from his break, and like the chill guy everyone said he was, they laugh over the misunderstanding. I'm just kidding. He's pissed off and Krill is forced to f kill him to death. A little traumatized but now presentable with clothing, Krill is led in to see the Duchess, who lives a life of lavishness by taxing all the subjects. Krill expresses to her that he wishes to have his shell back and that he's a little concerned that all the crabs are turning into zombies out there. The Duchess kind of ignores the whole zombie thing and tells Krill that if he wants to get his house back, he'll go check up on the scouting party that was supposed to find a treasure but never came back. On his way to the cave, Krill meets up with a magic moon snail that teaches him how to channel his inner magic called Umami, as well as how to purge himself of his microplastics in order to increase his abilities, and how to shelleport. Armed with all of this knowledge, Krill finds a shiny pearl in the cave that he was investigating and heads back to give it to the Duchess. He finds the Duchess's castle in ruins, with all the residents having succumbed to the gunk. The Duchess herself is infected as well, so Krill just wipes her off of next year's census. He then spots the lone shark who was watching their fight, and he leaves with the shell with the intention to pawn it off for some extra money in the city. Krill once again pursues the lone shark. Eventually, Krill makes it to New Carcinia, which is a sprawling city that's paved with very long pharmacy receipts and bustling with sea creatures. They're all excited for a holiday called Trash Day, which is coming up soon. Krill searches the upper city and the seedy underbelly to see if he can find his shell and get it back. By the way, these QR codes actually work and it's a really good Easter egg, so I'm not gonna spoil it, I'll just leave it up for you to scan and find for yourself. Eventually, Krill finds his shell in the hands of a prawn who owns a pawn shop and his name is Pronathan. And he's definitely not the Lone Shark. I'm just kidding, he definitely is the Lone Shark. Pronathan isn't willing to part with the shell unless Krill makes it worthwhile to him. Trash Day comes, which is when a bunch of trash falls from an island made of trash up above, and the residents are going nuts over it. The biggest piece of trash that falls from the sky is a message from Captain Clawbeard, who is regarded as a sort of prophet to these sea creatures. Conch, the city's historian and museum keeper, deciphers a message as a map for a treasure. However, most of the map is missing, with the exception of a forest at the northern end, which they assume means the expired grove, which is just north of New Carcinia. Firth, who is a small business owner, wants to find the map so he can get rich and just really show off to everyone. Tortellini, the town greeter, wants to find the treasure so he can bring more tourism to New Carcinia. And Nemma, a restaurant owner in the Undercity, wants to fix up her restaurant. As they're all fantasizing about finding this treasure, Roland, the cartoonishly evil mustache twirling billionaire, 
shows up and suggests they just let him get the treasure because he has the most resources and he can safely get it without anybody else having to endanger their lives. Krill and Pranathan watch on from the outskirts and Pranathan says that if Krill can bring the treasure to him, then he can have his shell back. This gets Krill really excited and so he loudly exclaims, I'm gonna go find that treasure. And everybody else interprets this as Krill standing up to the billionaire Roland and it starts to kind of ignite a fire with the people that they don't necessarily have to go along with what the billionaire says. Krill heads north towards the expired grove, but he has to go through a big sprawling plain known as the Sands Between, which is prowled by a giant cannibalistic crab known as Pagoras the Ravenous. Krill meets up with Chitin, who is a surviving guard from the Duchess's palace, and Chitin reckons that the infection is a curse brought on by greed instead of, you know, pollution, and seeks to find whatever monster cursed the area and kill them. Krill ventures into the grove where what used to be a small homely town has now been completely overrun by the gunk. There, Krill duels Heikea, the intimidation crab, who is wielding two chopsticks. After several probably canonical attempts, he vanquishes Heikea and finds the missing piece of the map. This piece of the map reveals the next location that they need to go to, which is a mailbox in the bottom right corner of the cereal box. Krill goes on a peaceful stroll through the sands between to get there. The area to the southeast is a company town owned by Roland, where all of his employees are forced to live. On his way in, Krill is confronted by Inkerton, Roland's goon, not that kind of goon, and he doesn't want Krill to get in. After a quick duel, Inkerton leaves, saying that it's not worth his time. Not worth my time. The company town is very polluted, and when Krill questions why such a smart businessman would give his employees such a terrible place to live, he's told that it's just because that is the smart thing to do for a business. Also in the company town, Krill finds the mailbox that was indicated on the map. It takes a bit to get there, and Krill has to deal with the Ceviche sisters, but he manages to take them out and get to the second piece of the map. This piece of the map reveals a giant angry crab in the center, which means, you guessed it, Krill has to fight Pagoras the Ravenous. He's actually not as tough as he looks, so Krill manages to take him out and get the map. The map is completed and it reveals a dock near a boat, which is close to the treasure, which Conch interprets to mean that the treasure is in the slurry, which is an ocean of sludge on the outskirts of Roland's company town. By the way, the entire time Firth is pulling all this we BS, talking about how close we are to the treasure as Krill does all the work, I'm getting bad vibes from this guy. Roland comes in as they're planning on going to the slurry and takes the map, saying that it's far too dangerous for them and that he'll take it from here. Firth points out that that's not very free market of Roland to say, and Roland says, sure, you can do it and maybe the free market will provide, but I can't in good faith make it any easier on you. The gang runs off to the docks, but the problem is that the boats are all powered by electricity and their boat is completely dead. Firth says that between his adept business negotiation skills and Krill's inexplicable combat prowess, they can easily get a battery from the nearby power plant. This expedition is just Firth watching Krill do all the work while he talks condescendingly towards him for not knowing much about business or how things work. The factory is full of either scared or gunked out workers and at one point Krill laments that the world shouldn't have to be like this and the rich people keep screwing over everyone else and forcing them to do all the work for them. Firth hits him with the, oh, do you think we should just stop using money then? Firth also starts to consider the possibility that Roland, his idol, might be a pretty bad guy even though he's a genius, so Firth decides that he must be the one to find the treasure so he can be a more ethical billionaire than Roland and donate a lot of it to charity. Krill asks why he doesn't just let everyone have the money that they need, and Firth says it's because he doesn't trust them to be responsible with that money. He then allows Krill to go into the heart of the factory to get the battery, because he thinks that Krill should have all the glory. When Krill enters, he's met by Voltai, who is an electric eel that is armed with a blow dryer that shoots electricity, a toaster that shoots, well, toast, a Wi-Fi adapter that sends electric shockwaves, and a guitar. And let's just say that this is the worst designed boss in the game. The projectiles make it hard to get close, and even when you do get close, you can only get in like one hit before the projectiles push you away again. Luckily, Aggro Crab added a lot of accessibility options to this game, so anyone struggling with a boss in another crab's treasure can just do this. I should probably mention that part of Krill's magic umami abilities is that he gets some of the powers and traits of the major bosses that he defeats, kind of like how Thanos or Walter White would do. So after he f***ing shoots Voltai, Krill gets the ability to summon an electric eel, which he uses to open the door and then power the boat. On the boat, they all take turns saying what they plan to do with the money, and notably, most of their answers have changed. Firth now wants to donate all of it to charity, according to him. Conch wants to renovate the museum, and Nemo wants to save her bar and help her kids have a better life. 
The three of them make a pact to split the treasure if any one of them gets it first, but Krill refuses to join in on the pact, saying that he needs it to get his shell back and Pronathan will only accept the full treasure as a payment. He just wants to get back to his peaceful life before he knew what microplastics and money were. Nema gets angry at Krill and calls him selfish, but Firth says that Krill is within his rights to do whatever he wants with his own property. The crew makes it to the mouth of the drain, where Roland's ship is fishing out the treasure as they arrive. They rush over to try and stop them, and Kaiten fights Inkerton while Krill takes on Roland in a giant pinball machine. Okay, I guess it's a normal sized pinball machine, it's just that everyone's small, you know what I mean. Krill wins the fight, but Roland survives and pulls up the treasure and starts monologuing about how he would have let all that money trickle down to them, but since they got greedy and wanted it all to themselves, he's going to have to punish them for it. Krill gets fed up, believing that he has worked the hardest while everyone has benefited off of his work and therefore he deserves the treasure, and so he jumps on the treasure which sends it and everyone else down into the depths. In the depths, Krill feels the guilt of having sent everyone to their doom as he tries to find other survivors. He finds Firth standing by the treasure chest, which just happens to be a bunch of worthless paper. Firth then blames Krill for dragging everyone into the treasure hunt. Krill starts hearing a sinister voice telling him that the world just needs to be torn down. If the world is ugly, then you need to fight. Fight to rip this ugly world apart. Krill is about to just let himself die, but is saved by Nema. After this, Krill confides in her that he never really did anything before going on this adventure. He just sat around all day in his shell, and while he was peaceful and content, he thinks everything that he has witnessed and gone through will make it impossible to go back to that kind of normality ever again. Krill and Conch find a relic from the ancient world, which is just a piece of styrofoam by the way, and Conch deduces that must mean that the gateway to the old ocean must be nearby. Once they find the entrance to it, Conch lets Krill know that the ancient hermit crabs of old created a magical relic called the Perfect Whirl that could get them rich and let Krill get his shell back. This convinces Krill to stay the path, even though he was tempted to turn back and just cut his losses. Now close to the entry point of the old ocean, Krill spots Inkerton and Roland lost and arguing over each other about the treasure. Inkerton, affected by the gunk, shoots Roland in anger and turns to Krill. After defeating Inkerton, Krill and Conch find an elevator to the old ocean and descend down there to the city called Carcinia, which is now so infested with bleach that it is uninhabitable. Minus the fact that it's filled with gunk infested monsters. Also, to avoid any confusion, this is Carcinia, and the other city is New Carcinia. While Krill searches for the perfect whirl, the ominous voice that Krill spoke with earlier reveals to him that it is the agony of the ocean and the embodiment of all souls that were lost due to pollution. It seeks to have the world destroyed, as that is where the Earth is inevitably headed. Krill makes it to the throne room of Carcinia, and Conch reveals to him that this must be where the perfect whirl is being kept because the greedy ruler of Carcinia stole it from the wise magical hermits who created it. Conch also reveals to Krill that he knows all of this because he was there when he saw the people of Carcinia pollute the town and ruin it 30 years back. You know, the ancient days. He was able to evacuate as a child and has had to watch the residents of New Carcinia repeat all the same mistakes. The true reason Conch wants a perfect world is to save the city from having the same fate. In the throne room, Krill confronts Kamsha, the Bleached King. He's the one who led Carcinia to ruin out of his greed and indifference to the city being infected by soap and bleach. Krill defeats him in battle, but since this is one of the final bosses in a Souls-like game, Agro Crab was probably contractually obligated to make this a surprise two-stage boss fight. Kamsha molts his skin and comes back as Kamsha the Reborn. Krill manages to defeat Kamsha and descends into the throne down to the bottom of the drain. Krill and Conch find the perfect world, the magical relic that could save them, but just as they're about to take the world and save the city from pollution, Kaiten has been affected by the gunk and is now under the control of the Praia Dubia, otherwise known as the Ocean's Agony. The Praia Dubia is hoping to spread the gunk and speed up the end of the world. It's angry to the point of not wanting to even try to fix things anymore. It just wants the perfect world to use its power to end everything, and it's angry at Krill for not being angry and destructive about the fate of the world like it is, so naturally it tries to kill Krill. But Krill the Unkillable manages to defeat it in battle. As a last ditch effort, the Praia Dubia destroys itself while trying to destroy Krill, but he manages to survive. Krill speaks to Kaiten, who lies dying on the ground, and she tells Krill that it's okay to be angry and to use that anger, but implores him to use his anger as a driving force to help others not to destroy like she almost did. 
Krill decides that he's going to use the perfect world to save her life when Firth pops in and takes it for himself. Krill implores Firth to use it to save the hurt Chitin, but Firth instead wants to use the world to save the hurt economy. His plan is to use the world to sink Trash Island onto New Carcinia so they can have more trash and therefore it will stimulate the economy. He'll then use that wealth to help reduce pollution and the spread of gunk by approximately 20% sometime over the next 200 years. He thinks Krill is being ridiculous for getting angry over such a foolproof plan and the two fight over it. After defeating both phases of Firth in one try and not using a gun to skip the first phase after several failed attempts, Krill manages to take the perfect whirl and rather than use it to save Chitin or to stop the trash from falling, he uses it to anime punch Firth in the chest and explode Trash Island. Therefore, the trash still falls into New Carcinia in heaps and pieces and Krill and Firth both wake up in the city, but Firth... While speaking with the residents, Krill realizes that most people are excited for the economic implications of the trash falling from the sky, but some are upset that their houses were crushed, and Nemma is concerned that it'll make life tougher for her kids in the long run. Despite all of that, Nemma is committed to staying in New Carcinia because not only is it too expensive for her to get up and move, but she knows that she can make a small positive difference in everyone's lives there, even though the future is uncertain. Krill wonders to himself what's next for him, but decides that the first thing he should do is get his shell back from Pronathan. Krill asserts that since the immense amount of trash that fell is thanks to him, Pronathan should thank him by giving him his shell back. Pronathan says that he won't do that, and so Krill just... In an outro, the narrator says that the planet's future is uncertain, and whether we choose to actively fight against the systems that are causing the planet's destruction, or use our efforts to try to make the world a better place for others in a more personal level, we have to do something. The biggest sin we can commit is that of complacency with our society's trajectory. The background footage for this narration shows Krill setting out on another adventure, but without his shell, because he gave it to another crab who was in need. The game concludes by saying small acts of thankless kindness are what make this world worth fighting for. While the themes for this game are about as subtle as a brick to the face, I still want to talk about them. I think approaching capitalism from the lens of sea creatures was a great way to talk about the subject, because not only did this allow them to let you view through the lens of a creature that didn't even know what money was at the start of the story, but it also shows one of the ugliest effects of capitalism, which is rampant pollution of the planet in pursuit of profit. Krill is probably the most sane person in the story because he's the one who's asking the honest questions like, why doesn't the billionaire labor with his employees? Or why do you need to own land? Isn't it just here? The snail at the very beginning sets the tone for the game. He's somebody who hates the system, thinks that he's being worked to death for nothing, and yet as soon as somebody challenges and questions that system, he gets angry and tries to kill him. The enemies are very contradictory to themselves and hypocritical, as their rationale for their actions will change as soon as their worldview is challenged and met with the slightest bit of dissonance. It also is pretty funny and appropriate that the final boss of Capitalism the game is essentially a stand-in for that guy you know who makes 50k a year, but will still give his life for a billionaire because he believes that that could be him one day. But it's true, it's appropriate because the system is only as strong as the people who will tolerate it. I think even the biggest simps for capitalism will have to admit that the system is far from perfect and that there are people who are just born with an unfair advantage and others who are born predestined to live miserable and poor their entire lives. And that insane wealth like what Roland has would not exist without exploitation. It's also impossible to deny or ignore that it incentivizes greed, shortcuts, and endangering others and that this mentality has led to us speedrunning the destruction of ecosystems, and it will have effects that will eventually become undeniable, even for the most adamant deniers. However, the conclusion to Another Crab's Treasure doesn't involve the sea critters dismantling the oppressive establishment board by board, or sawing the tables of tyranny in half, or even gnawing at the ankles of big business. It's pretty clear by the end of the game that they are too far gone and too set in their ways to ever make a substantial enough change to not have the gunk or microplastics be a part of their everyday lives. Much like at this point, barring an apocalypse, it's unlikely we will ever see the end of homelessness, exploitation, hunger, or mass pollution in our world. And just like how Krill didn't use the perfect world to fix anything, 
we don't have a magic MacGuffin that will suddenly fix every problem in our society, and we're too far gone to completely reverse the damage to our planet. So when it comes to problems in our society, you can either be angry and unproductive like the Praia Dubia or like people who just complain on Twitter all day. You can be angry and productive like Krill or Nemma who seek to change society or at least change the lives of those near them. But you should never be complacent or complicit to the problems in society. The absolute worst thing you can do is nothing. The melancholic ending to another crab's treasure stands in stark juxtaposition to its bubbly exterior, but it's really the only ending I feel that could ever feel earned given the allegorical nature of this story. But that being said, I appreciate everybody for watching this video and giving me the gift of your time. I hope that it has been able to brighten your day at least somewhat. I'm really looking forward to answering all of the Oh, well, if they don't like capitalism, why are they selling a video game comments in the comment section? But above all else, I just hope you have a great day. Hopefully I get to see you again. If not, have a great life. See ya.